welcome uh, everybody to today's session uh, of young india intensivist critical care sunday webinars and uh, today's uh, webinar is on uh, post operative care and complications and uh, the speaker today is uh, dr karthik dr karthik panadam is a, a senior fellow in liver intensive care in the very prestigious uh, kings college london and earlier he had taken a very nice uh, talk on acute liver failure for us which many of you may have attended those of you who did not attend it is up there on our youtube channel so without further ado i'll ask uh, dr karthik sir to please uh, start the lecture we'll take the questions in the end thank you sir please thank thank you dr tapesh for the introduction uh, so uh, today's talk we will be uh, talking mainly about cardiac neuro and uh, liver uh, uh, patients who do come to intensive care i will not talk about trauma or uh, other uh, cases because most of the problems in these three subgroups will cover all the subgroup of uh, patients uh, dr tapesh i need to uh, share the screen yeah one one minute yeah I think you'll be able to share the check now. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to share the screen. Post up ICU share. Yeah. Let me know if you can see the PowerPoint yeah, properly. We can see. We can see. Just enlarge it. Yeah. Okay. So post op complications in intensive care. Uh, so there are multiple types of patients that come to intensive care not just uh, cardiac neuro and liver but i have chosen these three cases uh, simply because the problems that arise in these three cases are the most difficult to manage they are most likely to need intensive care and they are most likely to need intensive care interventions that will change outcomes so uh, uh, so the first thing to know if for any post operative patient is one know your patient by know your patient i mean the patient's age sex history previous uh, uh, comorbidities if they have had any previous surgeries any complications of those surgeries so all these uh, knowledge is very crucial to understand and this can be easily obtained even if you are sitting in intensive care and waiting for a patient who is coming in it can just be a quick uh call to the uh, theaters or uh, the anesthetists or the surgeons and just make sure you have knowledge of who's coming into your icu the second is obviously know the surgery itself so each surgery has a very specific set of complications for example a cardiac surgery can have uh, tamponade and bleeding a patient with a neuro surgery can have raised icp uh, as a major complication a patient with post liver transplant can have either bleeding or clotting a thrombosis so uh, each surgery has the uh, problems that will have to ring in your head are quite specific to the surgery that is being uh, performed so you need to know the surgery dr tapesh yeah sorry there is some audio disturbance dr tapesh audio disturbance Yeah, yeah. I think I think you might. It might be better if you mute. Maybe now. No, no. There is no disturbance from my on this at least. You carry on. Oh, try, try, try to mute yourself. Let's check okay. if it's. Uh... Okay, okay. Yeah. Now it's fine. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so know the surgery, and you need to know the surgeon as well. Uh, so for example, each surgeon one has specific expectations post-operatively, and have they have a specific ways of communicating the surgical problems. so what is on the text may not always be what is the what's going on so it, it is very good to have a word with the surgeon himself or his registrar or have a word with the anesthetic team to know what actually went on with the surgery and know what happened intraoperatively both the anesthetic side and the surgical side hearing the story from one side will sometimes be misleading you can hear that the anesthetic anesthetist will say the surgery was uncomplicated and you might get a patient who is bleeding profusely and you might get a, a surgeon coming and saying patient was absolutely fine and the anesthetist will come and tell you uh, oh no the patient has a recent history of myocardial infarction or 
has a recent history of stroke. So, so the history from both sides is very important. And uh, most importantly, apply your common sense. So these are basic principles of post-operative case. Uh, apart from general intensive care principles, so you need to know the patient. You need to know the surgery that's happening. You need to know about the surg surgeon and the anesthetist. Know what happened intraoperatively from both sides, the anesthetic side and the, and the surgical side, so that you can apply all that information on the patient that arrives in your intensive care unit. Uh, so today's talk, this is the crux of the talk. We'll be talking about post-cardiac surgical patients, how we will manage intra-aortic balloon pumps and uh, PA catheters. I want to be specific because it will help to one, retain interest and two, it will also help you to gain some skills which are specific to these surgeries. Uh, and anybody who's very sick with a cardiac problem post-operatively, you can manage with these uh, devices. So it is a useful thing to know in, in intensive care. Post-neurosurgery, we will be discussing about raised ICP, how we measure and how we manage. And post-liver transplant, I will just be very specific and try to talk about the bleeding complications and how we measure and manage. So post uh, coming to post-cardiac surgery, uh, you need to, there is a lot of labs and tests that need to be uh, checked for every patient who comes post-operatively. Uh, there is some imaging that may need to be done. For example, if they've uh, had a cardiac surgery, a chest x-ray uh, to look for some uh, basic complications like what can, uh, can be a cardiac tamponade, a pneumothorax, uh, even just fluid overload or pulmonary edema, they might have a background of heart failure. So all these complications need to be picked up quite quickly and it's a very easy bedside uh, tool, the X-ray, and it will help you to pick up these things. Uh, regarding monitoring, uh, so one is hemodynamic monitoring and other is bleeding monitoring. So these two components need to be thought of separately. So you need to first think of the hemodynamics and then come to the uh, monitoring of the bleeding. Monitoring of bleeding is usually done by lab tests like uh, um, INR, platelets, fibrinogen, and uh, you can use uh, rotational, that is uh, rotational thromboelastometry, that is Rotem, or a tech, that is thromboelastography. So these are point of care devices, which are now available across a lot of intensive cares, and you will especially find them useful in post-cardiac surgery and post-liver transplant surgery, because they will give a global assessment of bleeding and will tell you which component which part of the bleeding is affected so that you can give the products in a more titrated and specific manner than to just simply give one is to one is to one like we do in trauma. Uh, in a cardiac surgery patients, you need to know the patient's background. That is, you need to know how many uh, previous surgeries they've had, why they are getting the surgery. That is uh, what they presented with. Did they present to intensive care with uh, quite a severe uh, LAD disease that is uh, needing a stenting uh, and a, a potential ca cabbage, uh, or is it a simple long-term problem that they've decided, okay, let's get it operated now. So you need to know the patient background. You need to know the indications of the operation. You need to have the pre-operative reports that are pertinent to the surgery that they are undergoing. For example, if it is a valve surgery, you need to know the valve pressures, the echo studies. If it's a, a CABG, that is a coronary artery bypass graft, then you need to know the uh, previous uh, catheterization reports and what type of operation is being performed, whether it is a venous graft, whether it is an arterial graft, uh, what is the surgeon planning to do and why and what has happened. So all these need to be uh, uh, in your uh, uh, handover. The success of the operation. So the success of the operation is in a cardiac surgery is usually determined by the duration of the cardiopulmonary bypass. So the duration of the cardiopulmonary bypass is crucial because for every 20 minute increase in the cardiopulmonary bypass time, the chances of having complications, including uh, neuro neurological cognitive impairment and long-term uh, disabilities will increase by almost 10% for every 20 minutes. So this is a very important number. You need to know the cardiopulmonary bypass time. So this will also tell you how quickly the uh, patient might wake up and how uh, how uh, well they might wake up. That is whether the neurology might be uh, deranged or not. And the aortic cross clamp time should also be noted. Uh, the current infusion that the patient is being transferred with is obviously very crucial. Sometimes some of the infusions are stopped just for the transfer. For example, 
they may be on a norad and vasopressin infusion and the, the the vasopressin infusion might have been stopped to make the transfer easier so you need to know exactly what infusions were running prior to transfer and during the transfer and at the tra time of transfer and also make sure you know if the patient is being paced or not so being paced or not sometimes when the monitor is shifted from the anesthetic monitor to the intensive care monitor the pacing uh, setting might not be switched on so the rhythm will not look you will not pick up the straight white lines that usually come for the pacing so make sure you know if the patient is being paced or not and make sure you it is included in the handover some cardiac surgical patients may have been preoperatively quite well uh, but after the surgery either because of a surgical complication of some intraoperative events they may have developed some level of uh, bleeding and uh, cardiogenic shock and they may have needed some devices these devices like the intra aortic balloon pump or the ventricular assist devices or nitric oxide might have been used for right heart failure so all mm -hmm. these uh, you need to know whether they are uh present and if they are present you need to at least know what settings they are on and make sure you are not in a sort of situation where this patient has been transferred with the devices you do not know what to do with the device and then you are in a place where you are asked to manage these devices so make sure in time you are able to uh, have a good grasp of what the patient is coming in with and as soon as you know these bits it will be very easy for you to Uh, manage any complications and you'll know who to call in case of any problems and obviously you also need to know the pre op medications this is important uh, more because uh, some of these cardiac patients may need to restart the medication so you need to find a route to restart the medications for example you may need to put a nasogastric tube which may they not sometimes have or they can have these medications after a period of time so the duration of restart has to be decided and uh, that is obviously on a case to case basis uh so the things you need to immediately check as the patient comes in is one the check the endotracheal tube and check bilateral chest entry uh the reason that and check the ventilator settings if the high, ventilator settings show that the pressures are very high and your auscultation is also not showing good air entry there are chances that the chest has been closed too tightly and this is usually checked intraoperatively so whenever the surgeon closes the Uh, sternal wound uh, immediately at the end of the closure they will check with the anesthetist if there is a uh, if there is any ventilator uh, pressure rise like rise in plateau pressures or peak pressures just after closing the chest but if this check has not been done or sometimes the tamponade develops even after the uh, surgery and during the transfer it may have increased so the initial ventilator settings are very important to pick up this uh, tightness of the chest which is quite, can be quite dangerous and quickly lead on to tamponade and uh, cardiogenic shock so this needs to be checked on arrival uh, the initial hemodynamic parameters the peripheral pulses all the pulses need to be checked uh, you need to check the rhythm in which the heart is in and whether the being paced or not and each of these numbers has to be documented it's important because the patient might deteriorate quickly and also the patient might improve quickly so you need to know where you are starting from so that you know what's going, what is happening because if you take the numbers 30 minutes after arrival you will not be aware if it's an acute event or if it's something that the patient came in with uh, uh, neurologically it is important to check the gcs check the pupils uh, sedation and analgesics obviously most of these patients will be quite heavily sedated and uh, analgesic so they will not be having any level of gcs they'll be m3 but that it needs to be documented and the pupillary size can be very uh, important pupillary reaction can be more important because uh, they can sometimes develop some level of uh, bleeding because heparin is quite extensively used during cardiac surgery and some uh, old patients diabetics and uh, previous history of stroke they have they, there have been reported cases of intracerebral hemorrhage during the cardiac surgery so uh, this can be picked up earlier by the uh, by checking the pupillary sizes and the reactivity uh last but obviously one of the most important another part of the cardiac assessment would be checking all the tubes drains and lines so make sure uh, by tubes i mean they mostly have chest tubes and sometimes pericardial uh, tubes that are coming from the front they will have chest drains and they will have lines including central line arterial line sometimes they will have a femoral arterial line 
we may have the intraaptic balloon pump which is uh, usually connected to the femoral artery uh, with a sheath and uh, so all these lines need to be checked whether they are one functioning two whether there's any mechanical uh, kink and three they sometimes have small clots in them which need to be very carefully managed because flushing these lines if there's a clot in the line can potentially cause quite severe uh, complication for example if you have an intraaortic balloon pump and there is a clot in it and you flush it the clot can directly go to the uh, uh, brain causing a stroke and go to the left subclavian arteries causing uh, 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 occlusion and thrombosis so this need to be carefully checked make sure you do an arrival ecg chest x ray and the bloods in the bloods when you send a routine bloods don't forget the cardiac specific bloods like troponins ckmb and uh, sometimes nt pro bnp if there is a background heart failure the reason being they do there is a chance of myocardial ischemia even if you do have had had just had your uh, uh, coronary artery bypass graft uh, this may be because sometimes the uh, lad might uh, the new graft might occlude causing ischemia and uh, infarction so troponins are very important and serial measurements will be helpful in management uh, regarding post operative bleeding uh, so usually whenever there is a post operative bleeding if you ask the surgeon what is why is the patient bleeding they will say it is a medical bleed and if you ask the medical team or the anesthetic team why is the patient bleeding they will say it is surgical bleed so it is usually a very sort of tricky situation for an intensivist to be in because you need to actually find out what the problem is and then treat the problem and it is very difficult to obtain the information from the uh, clinicians usually involved in the surgery so the best way to go about uh, deciding how to manage post op bleeding is understanding that the bleeding can be because of medical reasons and surgical reasons and each one has its own uh, uh, pathway to uh, manage so medical bleeding can be initially investigated using hemoglobin platelets inr and fibrinogen so these four numbers are very very important uh, many centers do not have serum fibrinogen easily available so uh, a hemoglobin platelet and inr should be uh, good enough to start with uh, if the patient has not been given tranexamic acid prior to the surgery or during the intra op period that can be given during mm -hmm. the time of an acute bleed uh, but we need to remember that when you are giving the tranexamic acid there is a chance of the graft thrombosis in cardiac surgeries so this has to be kept in mind uh, so before giving the tranexamic acid we need to make sure there is uh bleeding that is concerning uh hemoglobin platelets and inr hemoglobin usually it's maintained more than 80 for all cardiac surgery surgical patients the reason being hemoglobin carries oxygen and oxygen carrying capacity is crucial during a period of uh, bleeding so uh, more than 80 is what is recommended uh for platelets for cardiac surgery the recommended number is uh, more than 50 uh but this number can be sometimes increased if there is very massive bleeding and targets of more than 80 or 100 are sometimes uh desired but that should be on a case to case basis and the general guidelines say that the platelet should be more than 50 uh inr should not be targeted for even for cardiac surgeries uh, the reason being uh of course fresh frozen plasma can be given but we are not chasing a specific inr value if it is high we can give some fresh frozen plasma uh, regarding fibrinogen, so fibrinogen, there is clear cut evidence in trauma to maintain more than 1 and 1 1.5. Both these numbers are used by different societies. Uh, for example, Society of Critical Care Medicine and uh, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, they have different numbers. One of them uses 1 and one of them uses 1.5. So, regardless of the number, fibrinogen has to be definitely more than 1 when you have acute bleeding. And if the bleeding is quite massive, it can be maintained more than 1.5. So, these are the lab values that you can use. The advantages they are used quite widely available disadvantages they cannot always give the information in time they might take almost 45 minutes to one hour to come back sometimes in some hospitals so that is a crucial time wasted and that is where these uh, point of care machines called teg and rotem come in so both teg and rotem uh, are devices that uh, measure the global hemostasis that is they try to recreate how bleeding happens inside the body and based on the numbers you can uh, decide what blood products you want to give we will discuss this in further detail when we come to liver transplants but remember that it can be a useful adjunct to decide why the patient is bleeding uh, 
uh, of course if the patient has received heparin intraoperatively and has had proteamine reversal sometimes the reversal may be inadequate so in medical bleeding uh, sometimes proteamine can be given even prior to getting the blood results with using a what is called the act uh, results and ucd act results of more uh, higher than 400 the uh, proteamine can be given at 100 uh, a dose of 100 and then you can uh, repeat the ACT and check if there is an effect. <laughs> Regarding surgical bleeding, so once you corrected all these numbers, uh, so all these numbers needs to be corrected quite quickly. So if you're not able to get the lab values, it is all right to just give blood products as you would in a trauma patient. You can give one packed cell, one platelet and uh, uh, one or two uh, uh, and one uh, FFP and give, keep giving in this ratio till you have the numbers and then you can obviously decide which product you want to specifically give. But if you do have the point of care coagulation, you can use it bedside and uh, get the information quicker to decide which blood products you want to give. So once you've corrected all of this and the patient continues to be hemodynamically unstable, uh, then you can probably think this is a surgical bleeding and more than 500 mils in the first hour as the, as the patient comes in is extremely significant and this needs to go back to theater. Uh, some surgeons might be very reluctant to go back to theater, but it is the, I think it is one, not just the responsibility, but it is important to get them back to theaters because some surgical bleeds cannot be managed regardless of how well you manage the medical uh, part and how well you maintain the hemodynamics. If there is a bleed that is happening inside the heart that needs to be opened and fixed. Uh, so that is very important to keep the surgeons at uh, close uh, quarters. So management principles, I will again repeat. Uh, so the basic principles will include temperature management. Make sure the temperature is more than 36 degrees. For every degree drop in temperature, the quality of clot formation is decreased. So this is very important to maintain the temperature. Uh, maintain the calcium levels. They, they are also crucial for uh, uh, blood coagulation and they get used up when you do give uh, packed cells. So keep be aware that when you are giving some uh, uh, red blood cells, you need to uh, probably keep a check on the calcium levels and keep uh, uh, topping it up. Uh, make sure the heparin or the warfarin that the patient might have been is definitely reversed. That is, you can base it on the INR and the ACT. And uh, some quite rarely you can use the DD AVP if you are suspecting um, uh, some uh, syndrome, but it is very unlikely. So it is not, it is just reserved for hematological patients, not for all patients. As I already said, the uh, platelets, cryo, FFP, and tranexamic acid. So I've, I've put it in a jumbled order here, but the ideal order of correction, that is the ideal order in which each of these should be given is the first should be given the tranexamic acid. And if you have all three are deranged, that is if the INR, fibrinogen and the platelets are deranged, the first thing you should give always is cryoprecipitate because fibrinogen is the thing that drops really quickly when there is an acute bleed. So follow tranexamic acid with cryoprecipitate and then platelets. And the last thing you give should be FFP. But in clinical practice, because we don't have a fibrinogen number or we don't have a point of care coagulation, the most common products given are tranexamic acid, platelets, and FFP. Uh, so if you do have the numbers, cryoprecipitate should be uh, the preferred first choice. Uh, and the most obvious thing to uh, the principle of uh, managing bleeding is call the surgeon and ask them to stop the bleeding and make sure they do it right at that point of time uh, because time is of essence. Uh, regarding cardiac, uh, sorry, regarding cardiac uh, tamponade, so I've already mentioned the bleeding principles. So when you have a cardiac tamponade post surgery, there are uh, multiple guidelines that say that you need to one, diagnose it quite uh, quickly. So a cardiac tamponade will be different from a simple hypovolemia. Whenever the blood pressure falls in a post-cardiac surgical patient, the first thing you should always do is give some uh, fluids and see if it is simple hypovolemia. If it does not resolve and the pressures on the CVP or the, that is the right-sided pressures are very high. If you have a PA catheter, if the pulmonary artery wedge pressure is high and the CVP is high, that means there is a lot of back pressure that is coming and this uh, you need to rule out cardiac tamponade very quickly. Uh, uh, you can use the echocardiograph bedside to diagnose a cardiac tamponade, but the problem in post-cardiac surgical patients are some, the pericardium is not always closed. So the image that you see will not look like a classic 
tamponade that you usually see in a post, I mean, in a normal heart, a post-surgical heart, the tamponade will, the bleed will be more diffuse. That is, the fluid will be more diffuse and it will, it will not be a very clear cut uh, picture like in a normal uh, uh, heart with a uh, intact peri uh, pericardium. So that needs to be kept in mind, but an echocardiograph will be useful if you do check and you can uh, de detect the tamponade early. And if there is a tamponade, the best thing to do is call the surgeon, get the theaters ready and move the patient to theaters. If the level of hemodynamic stability is so bad that you are not able to wait for the surgical team to come, the next best thing is to get the thoracotomy kit at the bedside and wait for the surgeons. But obviously there will be one or two situations when the patient does go into cardiac arrest and the post cardiac arrest protocol for cardiac surgery expects uh, every clinician to be able to open the chest. This has to be done only in extremis when you know that the only treatment for this patient is the opening of the chest. And otherwise you do not, you should usually wait for the cardiac surgeon and institute normal ACLS measures, including adrenaline and uh, uh, chest compressions, but ideally it should be done uh, immediately as soon as the arrest happens. Uh, now we'll discuss quickly about intraortic uh, balloon pump. So intraortic balloon pump is a device that is basically used to improve the cardiac perfusion uh, by putting a balloon in the descending aorta. You can see the image here. So this descending aorta is reached. Uh, so what we usually do, we put a femoral arterial uh, uh, guide wire, just like putting a femoral arterial line. And through the guide wire, you pass a sheath. Once the sheath is passed through, the intraortic balloon pump uh, catheter, the balloon is uh, deflated completely, and then it is passed through the sheath into the femoral artery, and this should pass without resistance into the descending aorta. The distance to the descending aorta is measured from as the level from the uh, uh, nipple to the uh, umbilicus plus the uh, from the femoral artery to the umbilicus, and this distance is uh, measured, and that exact length is pushed inside. Uh, there is a, a radiological marker at the tip of the uh, IABP, which you can see with a chest X-ray, and that should sit right at the left, uh, exactly at the left, uh, just at the level of the left uh, main uh, uh, bronchus. If it is further down and is turning around, it should not go to the arch of aorta. This is because if it goes further, the left subclavian artery supply can be uh, compromise. So you need to make sure it is not too far in. You should also make sure it is not too far down because if it is too far down, there is chance that there is some ischemia to the uh, abdominal organs for the, uh, with the blood supply that comes out. So the positioning is very important, which I will show in a ECG in the X-ray next, in the next slide. Uh, regarding the IABP itself, so you can see in the image here, uh, just a minute, let me so you can see in the image here that uh, in the ECG, so what, so you'll have an ECG also connected to the IABP machine. So once the R wave is detect detected by the IABP, it gets ready to inflate the balloon. So as soon as the R comes on the ECG, it gets ready to inflate. And exactly you can see here during the T, that is the T wave, that is ventricular depolarization, it, uh, inflates the balloon. So you can, this is the arterial trace, that's the arterial line trace. Normally you can see the systolic, a dichrotic notch, and then it goes down. So when the IABP is inflated just at the time of the occurrence of the dichrotic notch, the diastolic augmentation happens. That is during diastole, that is during ventricular relaxation, because of the back pressure, there is increase in the diastolic pressure, which causes improved myocardial perfusion. That is the Blood supply to the heart improves during diastole because of the intraortic balloon pump. And this peak should look very similar to the systolic peak. You can see the shape of the peak here. You can look, it goes up and down. And you can see the diastolic peak also go up and down. And the diastolic augmentation is higher than the systolic augmentation. So this is how the, uh, if the IABP works well, this is how it should look. If it is not working well, what can happen is this uh, peak if the dichrotic, if the IABP opens too quickly, then the dichrotic notch, you can't see the dichrotic notch. And this will uh, cause uh, problems in terms of there can be some uh, 
uh, regurgitation and uh, increase in the left ventricular pressures because the aorta is not closed and all, their all balloon is already opened. So this will cause uh, back pressure and increase in afterload, which is detrimental to the heart. If the IABP opens late, that is uh, once the diastole starts and then it opens, then it will cause a compression of the blood that has already flown across. And this will again lead to a worsening of the myocardial perfusion. So the timing of the IABP, you have to confirm with by checking the arterial pulse. And if the waveform is not looking this way, then it is a has to be the timing of the uh, um, IABP has to be rechecked. So you don't need to worry about this. So what you need to know is, you need to know this is the normal trace. For an intensivist, you need to know this is the normal trace. And if there is an error, then you need to check with the either the cardiology or the cardiothoracic fellow to make sure the IABP is being timed right and it is uh, functioning properly. Uh, so this is the pressure of the balloon. So you can see the balloon first inflates during the diacrotic notch and then it deflates here, leading to loss in pressure. So this augmentation pressure is uh, determined as about 10 millimeter higher than the normal pressures. And this augmentation uh, pressure, that is this, this uh, di diastolic maximum pressure should be maintained usually between about 80 to 90, higher than what we normally maintain on the map. You can see the radio epic marker in the aortic knuckle here. And this is the correct positioning of the uh, intra-aortic balloon pump. So you can see the marker here, just at the, just above the left main uh, 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 bronchus. So this is the, you can, the descending aorta usually comes down, turns around and comes around like this. So this would be the correct positioning. If it is higher, you need to pull it back. And if it is lower, you need to be uh, with, uh, introduce it further. So the, regarding the intraaortic balloon pump, I'm not going to talk about the troubleshooting because it can be complicated, but just understand that this is what it is. It will help in improving the myocardial perfusion. One of the main contraindications is aortic regurgitation when it will not work and it will worsen your uh, problem. So you need, in, in case the patient develops aortic regurgitation during the ICU stay or it has been wrongly placed, this has to be quickly uh, detected and managed. Uh, regarding pacing, uh, so many of the patients who do have uh, cardiac surgery will come to you with either a transvenous or a, a direct uh, epicardial pacing. So regardless of what the pacing is, you need to know what rate you have set. That is the rate determines how often the pacer will fire. You have to determine what is the output. That is how much energy is being delivered to the pacing leads. Uh, and you need to know the threshold. So for example, what is the lowest current that can be that the uh, that is enough for the for a trigger a uh, beat. So this will be different for different individuals and different placement. For example, epicardial leads will need lesser currents and uh, transvenous leads will be slightly more currents. But this usually is checked as soon as the pa pacing wires are placed. And this can be this information can be either taken from the anesthetist or the surgeon, so they will know what it is set at, and the threshold uh, is also they will be aware of regarding the output. And regarding sensitivity, so what? How much current can be detected to identify a depolarization? That is, that is, if they're using the ventricular ventricle to sense, then it will. When the ventricle starts uh, having a depolarization, if the sensitivity is too low, then it can detect even unnecessary uh, uh, electrical activity. And if the threshold is too high, it may not detect even if there is proper electrical activity. So this sensitivity again has to be set according to the patient and the uh, where they are placed. Uh, so you need to know what mode it is set at. Usually the first, there are three letters that are used. The first letter will be the chamber that is sensed. That is, you take the electrical information from either the ventricle or the atrium. And uh, you uh, that is how you sense the uh, chamber. And then you can pace the chamber. That is which chamber you are pacing. You can either pace the atrium or the ventricles. Usually it's the ventricles. And uh, that has to be, uh, you have to know which uh, the setting is at. And the last thing is, how does it work? Does it inhibit or does it uh, augment? So, or does it do both? So these settings you need to know about the pacing. Uh, so coming to the PA catheter. Uh, so the PA catheter is a very, very useful device in post-cardiac surgical patients, especially in those having right heart failure, uh, because uh, any other modality would not give the information in uh, real time. 
for example, if you use an echocardiograph, you can only have it at a, let us say, at a fixed period of time, and then it won't be there. The other alternative is used to use a trans esophageal echocardiograph. And if you do have these devices, they, they are obviously the gold standard in currently to manage uh, cardiac uh, problems, but they are still not widely available. And the level of, uh, uh, what to say, uh, training and knowledge is still, I think it is infancy. So the PA catheter can be used because the level of knowledge and experience usually is quite a lot more with the PA catheter and the technique is quite straightforward and it is more easily available. So the measurements that we can get uh, will include the central venous pressure. So uh, I'm not going through the placement of it. I think all of you hopefully can just see another YouTube channel and just make sure you know how it is being placed. So, the, but these are just the pressures that you can see. The right atrial pressures normally are zero to eight. The right ventricular pressures between 20 to 30 systolic and diastolic of zero to eight. So as soon as the catheter passes into the pulmonary artery, you will see a diastolic jump. That is the Diastolic pressures will jump from 0 to 8 to 8 to 15, as you can see here. And then there will be the, uh, you go inside the pulmonary artery and then you uh, inflate the balloon of the PA catheter. You will get the wedge pressure. This wedge pressure is basically the pressure transmitted from the left atrium to the uh, pulmonary artery catheter tip. Uh, the pulmonary artery has the two waves. That is the A wave, which is the atrial contraction and V wave, which is the uh, ventricular, uh, sorry, atrial, uh, atrial filling, that's atrial contraction and atrial filling. And this uh, atrial uh, filling can sometimes be uh, abnormally high in tricuspid regurgitation. And so that when you do the PA catheter and you see a very high V, you do not need to think that the it is not wedged properly. It may be because of tricuspid regurgitation. And in that case, the wedge pressure should be taken as the atrial, that is A, should be taken as the wedge pressure. Uh, so all these numbers can be derived once you place the PA catheter, that is the central venous pressure, the right ventricular pressure, the pulmonary artery pressure, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And from these, using a thermodilution, uh, that is a fixed technique, you can find the cardiac output. The pulmonary vascular resistance and the systemic vascular resistance can then be derived from the cardiac output. Uh, so I want you to look at the image here. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. So if you see, if you look over here, so you need to remember that the heart has two two sides. That is the right heart and the left heart. So when the uh, we'll first talk about the left. That is the left side. So left ventricle. So left ventricle pumps out blood, and that is producing the pressure called the mean arterial pressure. So this mean arterial pressure goes to the tissues. And then from the tissues, it comes back to the heart in the right atrium as the central venous pressure. So the pressure drop across the system from the left ventricle to the right atrium is the mean arterial pressure minus the central venous pressure. And this over the cardiac output will give the systemic vascular resistance. So this formula is very important. So and this will be determined by the systemic pressures. That is the numbers that we usually have quite easily by putting an arterial line and a central line. And uh, the cardiac output, which we have derived using the PA catheter, uh, the alternative to find the cardiac output is the PICO monitors where or the LIDCO monitors, which are also available. But once you have these numbers, the systemic vascular resistance can be uh, found out. And this is very a very useful number. The other side of the heart, you can see the right ventricle, which pumps out blood to the pulmonary artery and goes to the uh, lungs. So this pulmonary artery pressure, the, we take the mean pulmonary artery pressure, which we measure using the PA catheter. And the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which we measured by wedging, that is inflating the balloon of the PA catheter and finding the pressure of the left atrium, uh, that is on this side. So these two pressures, the pressure difference, divided by the cardiac output, which is the same for the left ventricle and the right ventricle, uh, will uh, give the uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, which will tell you if there is any increase in the pulmonary pressures. Um, so once you know what is going on in terms of if you have all these numbers, that is the uh, mean arterial pressure, the central venous pressure, the pulmonary arterial pressure, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and you've measured the SVR and the uh, PVR, you will know what the problem is or where the problem is. So once you know where the problem is, you will be able to treat. So we'll come back to this slide again. 
come back to these two slides again a bit later but this is how you interpret the information so when a, somebody has a right sided heart failure that is your right heart has failed obviously the because of the back pressures the cvp will be high and because the heart has failed there is no filling and there is no blood going to the left as well so the cardiac index that is the cardiac output will be low and because of the back pressure again the pulmonary vascular resistance that is resistance to flow into the heart will be higher so the high uh, pvr and for left heart failure again when the left heart has failed that is the left atrial pressure will high, be high that is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be high the cardiac index will again be low and because it's the left side you will find that the systemic vascular resistance will increase uh, so right heart and left heart failure i want to repeat again uh so it's very important to conceptually understand that the right side is the cvp and the left side is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and the right side is will determine the pulmonary vascular resistance and the left sided failure will affect the systemic vascular resistance uh so what happens here as you can see as we already told there will be a uh, high cvp high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure here a uh, low cardiac index on both sides and the pulmonary vascular resistance or the systemic vascular resistance will be high uh now we want to compare uh, cardiac tamponade and uh, cardiogenic shock so in this case you will see that in pericardial tamponade because the heart has been compressed and there is difficulty in blood coming in this will cause very high pulmonary capillary wedge pressures and central venous pressure that is both sides of the heart the back pressures will be high uh and the systemic vascular resistance again will be very high and cardiac index will be low uh compare this with cardiogenic shock which will also have high pulmonary capillary wedge pressures high cvps and low cardiac index along with the high svr so these both will present according to the pa catheter in the same way the way to distinguish these two is that in cardiac tamponade the central venous pressure and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be the same and this will not be the case in a cardiogenic shock where pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be higher so this is how you differentiate the cardiac tamponade and uh, cardiogenic shock using a pa catheter and uh, lastly coming to hypovolemia and sepsis uh, these are easy numbers the cvp and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures will be low in uh, both of them uh, the cardiac index in hypovolemia will be low and it will be high in sepsis because of the hyperdynamic circulation and also the systemic vascular resistance will be high in hypovolemia because of the stress response but in sepsis because of vasodilatation there will be low svr uh, so this is how you will interpret the cardiac data so once you know what the problem is if you know it is a right heart failure or a left heart failure or if you know it's a hypovolemia or cardiac tamponade you can decide on how you want to manage it so if you have a right sided heart failure that is the right side of heart is not pumping you want to one offload the heart that is decrease the uh, output pressures which can be done by decreasing the pulmonary pressures the decrease in pulmonary pressures uh, can be done uh, by using uh, some pulmonary vasodilators like uh, nitric oxide and uh, you can use the uh, uh, epoprostinol so these are the some of the agents that are used but these are very rarely used the problem being they will cause an increase of blood flow to the left heart and if there is a concomitant left heart failure then they can worsen the situation where they will uh, they are loading a heart that is already defining it difficult to pump out that is the left side so pulmonary uh, are not used acutely very commonly so if you have a right heart failure what you can do is to decongest the right heart you can use what is called mildenone and dobutamol so these are ino dilators so they dilate the out outflow and also augment the heart's pumping so dobutamol and mildenone are sometimes used to offload the right heart failure uh, if you have a left heart failure obviously you need to offload the uh, systemic pressures you need some anti hypertensives like nitroprusside and nitroglycerin uh, dobutamol and mildenone can also do the same uh, job and furosemide can be used to offload the afterload again by uh, diuresing the uh, patients so all these drugs have specific actions and each of them are have different problem for example dobutamol is has do, for uh, dobutamol is sometimes not used because 
it promotes urine output and this can falsely elevate the urine output and worsen the hypovolemia and so it is not usually used these days and also it causes more chances of arrhythmias dobutamin again causes arrhythmias in form of tachycardia and uh, uh, so it is also not used when the heart rate is very high uh, mildrenone again it can be used but the problem is it takes it has a half life of about uh, 4 hours that it take 4 hours to reach a trough level and start working so that will be a problem in sometimes uh, sodium nitroproside and nitroglycerin are quick on quick on quick off agents they work very quickly as an anti hypertensive so they can always be used in the acute situation uh, furosemide is very safe drug and can always be used so these each of these drugs can be used in specific situation so the important thing is to diagnose what the problem is and once you diagnose what the problem is it is it becomes very straightforward to manage the uh, uh, cardiac issues coming to uh, neuro uh, so coming to the neurosurgical issue so regarding neurosurgeries the most common problem post operatively will be a raised icp and second will be meningitis and infections so raised icp can be measured by multiple methods the most common one that is used is called the external ventricular drains so these are drains basically they do a ventriculostomy go to the ventricle put a catheter and that will give you the intracranial uh, pressure this is the most one that is most commonly used the problem being it is one it is easy to use uh, the problem is it has high chances of introducing an infection like ventriculitis or meningitis and so has to be carefully handled and managed the intraparenchymal catheter can sometimes be used subdural and subdural bolts are very rarely used these days uh, so the intracranial pressure the waveform will look something like this if the waveforms are small and within the normal range it's called c waves and if we have short term bursts of about 20 to 30 from the baseline then that is called b waves it is slightly raised intracranial pressure and if the intracranial pressure is raised very very high then the intracranial pressure more than 50 or 60 and sustained for about uh, 5 to 10 minutes and that means there is a very very high intracranial pressure and needs to be managed very very quickly how will you manage the raised intracranial pressure make sure the neck is free usually we try to avoid putting neck lines on both sides uh, uh, so that the drainage to the brain is uh, fine and keep a head elevation uh, maintain sodium levels of 145 to uh, 155 uh, maintain co2 levels of uh, 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 30 to 35 but this only works for the first uh, uh, 12 to 24 hours so it's a brief uh, period of time when this will help in uh, maintaining the intracranial pressure but then it will start increasing after that the cerebral perfusion pressure is uh, the pressure that the driving pressure for the cerebral uh, perfusion and this uh, in the equation it is given as the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure uh, if you are suspecting raised intracranial pressure and you do not have a monitor we can safely assume that the icp is at least 20 and so the cerebral perfusion pressure targets should be at least 60 millimeters of mercury. So the mean arterial pressure should be maintained more than 80. So it's the reason why we maintain slightly higher pressures when there is a higher uh, chances of raised uh, intracranial pressure so that we can maintain the cerebral perfusion pressures more than 60. Make sure the patient is adequately sedated, having analgesics and has uh, anti-seizure medications because there might be some underlying seizures that might worsen the ICP. Uh, the last resort obviously is surgery in the form of decompressive craniotomy or at least they can put an extra ventricular drain and make sure we are monitoring the intracranial pressures which will be useful to uh, guide our therapies. Other intensive care interventions will include relieving the abdominal and thoracic uh, pressures so make sure the patient is uh, one opening the bowels or if they have a very massive ascites or any other uh, uh, thing that can be relieved and the thoracic pressures in the form of you can increase the peep that will also decrease the sort of uh, uh, pressures on the intracranial or the intrathoracic pressures by decreasing the tidal volumes you can uh, decrease the amount of pressure back pressure on the icp some of the monitors that can be used uh, in this period is the transcranial doppler so the transcranial doppler can detect vasospasm in post subarachnoid hemorrhage patients who are unconscious uh, it can predict the onset of what is called the delayed ischemic neurological deficit, which usually happens about 21 days after the sub, within, uh, within 21 days of the post uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages. Uh, it non invasively estimates the intracranial pressure, so it is uh, less invasive and it is, can be done at the bedside and it can detect 
uh, cerebral blood flow and very useful to in post traumatic brain injury patients uh, so that is about the neurological uh, uh, problems post operatively that is raised intracranial pressure and how we manage them uh, coming to post uh, liver transplant so for liver transplant the most important problem that you will be coming across uh, will be both bleeding and thrombosis so this is a it's a very so it's a very unique sort of setting so liver transplant patients have extremes of problems in terms of they have as a pre operatively they will have problems in their brain that is they will have hepatic encephalopathy uh, they can have acute if they are acute liver failure they may be having cerebral edema with raised icp which is a neurological problem again uh, so pre transplant they may be having cardiac issues like cirrhotic cardiomyopathy they can have uh, right sided uh, uh, right right ventricular diastolic dysfunction they can have uh, pulmonary hypertension so all these problems uh, can precipitate post operatively uh regarding the lungs they can sometimes have what is called a hepatopulmonary syndrome uh, so hepatopulmonary syndrome itself uh, will cause a level of hypoxia needing oxygen which they need to take uh, at home so they may need they may have may might have been on fio2 of 50 or 60% even at home prior to the transplant uh they can have problems in the abdomen which can include uh, ascites that is refractory ascites that is uh, not amenable to uh, any uh, therapies which is the reason why they are getting the transplants uh, they can have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis recurrent which can lead to lot of uh, bleeding and other problems uh, so uh, and they can have a preoperative kidney injury so having all organ systems affected is normal or it is usual when somebody undergoes a liver transplant and each of these problems can exacerbate once they do get a new liver problem specific to the surgery itself will include bleeding risk so most post liver transplant patients will have two abdominal drains on both sides and uh, these are monitored quite closely and if they there is any bleeding then it needs to be again managed in the same way so first you manage the medical bleeding and if it's still bleeding almost 200 to 500 mils every hour then the surgical team needs to be uh, approached and if they are concerned this patient may need to go, to go back to theater for a Uh, assessment of where the bleeding is from uh, regarding clotting so patients with uh, liver disease although they have high inrs they are also prone to thrombosis in a, a disproportionately high manner that is they can develop both bleeding and thrombosis quicker than the general population and this thrombosis if it happens in the hepatic artery can be devastating to the new liver graft so when the hepatic artery is thrombosed as soon as it's thrombosed there will be uh hemodynamic instability there will be metabolic derangement with acidosis and rising lactate and uh, uh, the definitive way to diagnose will be a, either a bedside ultrasound and if it is uh, not clear with the ultrasound then we need to confirm with the ct imaging and this thrombosis if it is there it means the graft has failed and this patient is considered as an acute liver failure and may need to go for a retransplant so this is a very crucial bit of post transplant uh, a uh, problem that need to be detected quickly and swiftly uh, graft failure usually it will present with very high ast levels that are persisting beyond uh, one or two days and this has to be closely monitored with uh, liver functions uh, and can be um, managed initially by steroid uh, uh, boluses and if the steroid boluses do not work adequately then you may have to provide some uh, sort of uh, either immunosuppression uh, Uh, or if nothing works then they may end up in complete graft failure and end up in liver failure which may need a retransplant uh, one of the most common one of the more common complications of post transplant is sepsis uh, and sepsis in post liver transplant is very very difficult to manage because these patients have long term liver disease which leads to bacterial translocation which cannot be treated quickly and efficiently with antibiotics so they usually need a longer period of antibiotics and they need higher grades of antibiotics because these patients might have had multiple episodes of sepsis prior to going in for the transplant so they usually the antibiotics given are a bit higher grade we will not start with amoxiclav it will usually be uh, piperacillin tazobactam and they can be upgraded if there is a worsening sepsis
So uh, regarding the immediate problems uh, post uh, liver transplant uh, and what you need to actually check before weaning these patients off the ventilator or uh, getting them to the uh, uh, ward, the first thing would be uh, you need to make sure the body temperature rises. This happens as soon as the graft starts working because of the increased metabolism that happens. Uh, usually patients with liver failure will have very low sugar levels. If that starts increasing by itself, then that, that means that the graft is functioning. Uh, so the bile production is uh, measured by using, when, the, when you put the abdominal drains, you can uh, see the amount of acetic uh, fluid being produced and that will be useful. Uh, and the other thing is normalization of the coagulopathy. Any coagulopathy that is there will slowly normalize over the first 24 hours. Uh, and uh, the more important and easy to measure at intensive care is the lactate clearance. So uh, if, if, if any of you have actually worked in post-liver transplant, you might have noticed, especially in living donor transplant. So as soon as the reperfusion happens, uh, within a couple of hours, the lactate rises quite high. And it, then it starts coming down quite drastically as soon as the new liver starts uh, functioning. And in uh, disease donor transplant, this obviously takes a bit more time, at least six to eight hours after the transplant, the liver starts kicking in. But you can see a quick fall in the lactate even if IV fluids are not uh, given at uh, this juncture. So this is a very good marker of good graft function. Uh, the vasculature always needs to be checked. So there is usually uh, every post-transplant liver patient will have an ultrasound then immediately post-transplant and 24 hours after post-transplant, depending on which center you work in. Some do it very early and late, but they will get uh, ultrasound to ensure that there is nothing that needs to be checked or missed. And they will always check for the hepatic vessels and the port portal vasculature. And if there is any block at any point of time, they may need a urgent CT scan and a uh, return to the theater. Uh, we've uh, come to towards the uh, almost the uh, final part of the talk. So this one I want to tell elaborately. I'll, I'll take about 10-15 minutes for this thromboelastograph because I think it's important in all post-surgical patients, especially in post-cardiac surgery and post-liver transplant. The reason being this uh, will give you a real-time assessment of the bleeding and you will be able to decide what blood product needs to be given and also you need to decide if uh, there is a residual heparin effect that is still there and that needs to be confirmed as well. So the thromboelastograph is a machine that basically has a cup and this cup is filled with the blood and the cup will contain some kaolin. Kaolin uh, initiates the uh, clotting process uh, and it's act similar to a uh, tissue uh, injury. So when you have a tissue injury, the clot formation initiates. So this clot formation initiation is determined by the R time. So the graph starts here and it keeps going here. And once the clot starts forming, this is the uh, this time is called the R time. That is the time taken for the clot to start to form. And this time is determined by the uh, coagulation factors that are there in the body. Uh, if the R time is increased, that is takes a longer time for the starting of the clot, then the normal value is five to 10 minutes. And if the clotting needs to, uh, if the clotting time is increased, then that will be because you do not have coagulation factors. And this for treatment, you need to give what is called the fresh frozen plasma. Uh, the dose of fresh frozen plasma usually given is 20 mils uh, per kilo body weight. Uh, so if the R time is increased, you have to give fresh frozen plasma. A caveat to this in cardiac surgery is the R time will also increase if you give heparin. So how will you find if the bleeding is because of uh, lack of coagulation factors or the administration of heparin? For this, the TEG machine has another uh, vial which you have to run uh, a separate test called the HEPTEG. In the HEPTEG, the cup in which you put the blood will have the uh, heparinase. So once you put the blood in the heparinase, any heparin that is there in the blood will get neutralized. And then again, if you run the tag, you will notice that the uh, if the R time was increased because of heparin, the heparinase would have destroyed the heparin and the R time would have normalized in the heptag. And if this normalization does not happen, 
then it means that the increase in R time is because of lack of coagulation factors for which we can use fresh frozen plasma. So that is the first part of the thromboelastograph. So once the clot starts forming, it uh, this is the acceleration phase of the clot formation. That is the strength of the clot is increasing very quickly. So the time taken to go from a height of two millimeters to a height of 20 millimeters is called the K time. The K time is the time taken to the clot to reach the fixed strength. And this is normally one to three minutes. So that this acceleration phase is determined by the amount of fibrinogen that you have in the blood. So the fibrinogen <clears throat> during a period of acute bleeding the fibrinogen falls very quickly and it is the first blood uh, problem to uh, uh, first component to fall so if the k that is the k time is uh, uh, <clears throat> increased or if the angle there is an angle that is formed so when you once you form the uh, graph if you draw a, a line from the starting of the uh, coagulation formation to the 20 millimeter height, you'll form what is called the alpha angle. So this angle will be more if the clot forms very quickly and it will be less if the clot forms very slowly. So this will help you de determine the, both the K time and the alpha angle will help you to determine if the patient is having adequate fibrinogen or not. And they will both be uh, deranged. That is K time will be increased and the angle will be reduced if there is a decrease in the fibrinogen and this decrease in fibrinogen can be treated with the help of cryoprecipitate. The dose of cryoprecipitate, uh, it's usually about each unit usually contains about 200 mils. It is it varies in different departments and different intensive cares and hospitals. Uh, so usually in our hospital at Kings, it comes in 200 ml vials. So we give two units that is 400 mils. That is about uh, the dose is like, the dose recommended is about five to ten mils per kilo, but we usually give a lesser dose. Uh, higher doses can be given if you are uh, if the level of derangement is more. That is regarding the K time and the alpha angle, which is the speed of fibrin accumulation determined by the fibrinogen. Uh, the once the clot starts forming completely, it will reach a maximum amplitude. So this is the maximum thickness of the clot. That is that is when you take the cup there is a pin in it and the pin is rotating. The resistance of the pin is what is measured on the graph. So when the resistance is maximum, it means the clot thickness is the maximum. And this maximum amplitude or maximum clot thickness is determined by the platelets. That is platelet levels will determine the maximum clot thickness. Uh, so if the platelet level is low, this can be very, very low. And this means you need to give some platelet transfusions. The other alternative reason for a drop in MA may be because of decreased platelet function, which can sometimes be seen post cardiac surgery. And it can also be seen in what is called von Willebrand's disease. And this, if you are suspecting, then you may have to give a DDAVP, that is Desmopressin. This is for the maximum amplitude. And the last part of the thromboelastograph is once the clot is formed, it is usually broken down by fibrinolysis and this fibrinolysis at the end of 30 minutes is measured. If the decrease is only 0 to 8 percent that is normal but if it comes down very quickly with before uh, time then it is not normal and this can be because of excessive fibrinolysis and this excessive fibrinolysis can be treated by anti-fibrinolytics like tranexamic acid uh, Aminocaproic acid can also be used, but it has been shown to have uh, increased uh, thrombotic complications. So tranexamic acid is the preferred one. However, tranexamic acid can also worsen thrombosis in uh, patients with cardi post-cardiac surgery. So it has to be given in very specific situations in uncontrolled bleeds and with evidence of fibrinolysis, which can be either evidence with a TEG or if you have D-dimer levels that can also be used as evidence for fibrinolysis can give tranexamic acid. Uh, I, I hope thromboelastograph is clear. I can, if we have any doubts, we can come back to this because it, this is a very important part of post 
operative complication that is bleeding and this is a very big component that you can use to manage the post operative bleeding uh, so if you do have doubts so let me know uh, and uh, yeah coming to the last uh, bit so all post surgical patients they are now asked to pass through what is called the enhanced uh, recovery after surgery pathway so this pathway is basically created so that because 90 to 95% of patients do not need intensive care and they do not need intensive care for a long period of time they will just need 24 hours of good monitoring and if everything is fine they can just uh, step down to a ward and go home quickly so that so that it gives us as clinicians less time to cause poss any possible harm uh, that is the concept behind uh, eras protocol so uh, regarding the pre operative intra operative and the post operative uh, uh, what is recommended now uh, this is for abdominal surgeries so uh, pre operatively educate the patients let them have clear liquids till 2 hours prior to surgery this is very important the pre op fasting guidelines are very clear clear fluids can be allowed up to 2 hours and they should be done uh, we can do mechanical and oral bowel preparation and optimize their comorbidities intraoperatively there are preset orders they are multimodal pain uh, control using restrictive fluid therapy and laparoscopic approach should be preferred because it causes less pain and quicker post op recovery uh, early feeding uh, after the post operative period is very very important because uh, post operative fasting is a very big Uh, issue in uh, abdominal surgical patients multimodal analgesia can be used so that we do not have the uh, we have the benefits of all the uh, pain management tools while avoiding the complications of them uh, remove the foley's remove the nasogastric drains and uh, take the drains out very quickly and so these are all concepts that need to be followed so that uh, you can move the patients out quickly and get them uh, uh, keep only the sickest of them in intensive care so that you can uh, dedicate more uh, time and effort on patients who really need them uh, we have come to the end of the talk uh, i might have gone a bit fast but i'm happy to go back to some of the slides and explain them if any of you have any questions yeah so <clears throat> thanks dr kartik uh, can you please stop the share screen yeah so we'll wait for the questions and uh, thanks for the wonderful talk uh, covering uh, cardiac intensive care little bit of neuro and liver transplant and uh, basics were covered very nicely so i'll just uh, take 5 minutes to talk about a few things maybe yeah. uh, pertaining to abdominal surgery so first mm -hmm. there is an entity called post operative surgeons which many of us don't realize is called post operative systemic inflammatory response syndrome and uh, it's responsible for a lot of things you know sometimes when the patient comes out and is in hypotension uh, one of the reasons can be post operative surge so this occurs because of the uh, dissection that we do and the trauma that is uh, created to the tissues releasing a lot of inflammatory cytokines so this results in uh, uh, you know a systemic inflammatory response syndrome which can have hypotension and myriad complications even if it does not have hypotension it can just result in uh, oliguria and you may think that the patient is lacking in fluids and uh, you may pump in a lot of fluids but is actually organ dysfunction occurring because of cytokines released during surgery so one should be aware of this uh, complication post operative surge i have seen it many times uh, people ascribe it very easily to sepsis while it is not sepsis and it just you just pump in antibiotics so one has to not be aware of this condition and it occurs generally as soon as the patient comes out of the ot he develops hypotension or if we having oliguria so one should be aware of this then just extending the real dysfunction part uh, to the post operative care uh, again uh, you know there was a trial about restrictive and liberal fluid strategy in the peri operative care this is a very uh, often quoted study done a few years ago and they showed that if you targeted a zero balance peri operatively at around 48 hours the results were worse over a 3 month or a 6 month follow up if you have a restrictive strategy then the aki incidence was increased so a zero fluid you know zero balance does not really help peri operatively 
you have to give fluids uh, guided by your fluid assessment. That is, this is a very uh, important trial, uh, liberal versus uh, restrictive fluid strategy in the perioperative care field. Now, uh, coming to other causes of post-operative hypotension, again, pertaining more to uh, abdominal surgery, but extending to the surgery as well. Uh, we have to realize apart from SIRS, that is post-operative SIRS and sepsis, there can be complications of spinal anesthesia. In fact, we had a patient who was undergoing joint replacement and uh, being done under uh, uh, spinal anesthesia and uh, inadvertently a little more went in and 10 minutes after coming to the ICU, the patient went to cardiac arrest. So one has to be aware of this. Then there can be Takasubu's cardiomyopathy also. There was another patient we had who came out of the OT, then developed severe hypotension, drop in ejection fraction, and it was Takasubu's cardiomyopathy, and that was due to surgical stress. There is already stress in some of these patients when they go on to the OT, and uh, the surgical stress further contributes to uh, the overall stress. Then sometimes you can get air embolism. Air embolism infrequently does occur and you can lead to sudden cardiac death. And then you have anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis has been described even to neuromuscular blocking agents. And we have seen this as well. The patient was actually a transplant, renal transplant patient, and he came out of the OT with severe hypotension. There was nothing else. The SVR was low and just you know carefully guided fluid strategy got him out. So anaphylaxis can occur interoperatively. It is well described. Once in a while, it does occur, even to neuromuscular blocker agents specifically. Uh, then it's very important, like you said, to review interop records because sometimes the handover is not very clear or the uh, anesthetist does not want to tell you there is drop in intraoperative hypotension. There can be use of, you know, even CPR and sometimes things are not very clear. So it's very important if the patient is having post-op hypotension to review the interop records. Uh, then another thing is steroid withdrawal. Sometimes, you know, the anesthetic record does not document uh, use of steroids prior to surgery. They have been on chronic steroids, and if you withdraw steroids, they go into hypotension because of an Addisonian kind of a picture. So this is another uh, thing sometimes which is overlooked. And, uh, and then you talked about it, right heart failure. If the patient has right ventricular dysfunction prior to surgery, then they can decompensate. The right ventricle can decompensate during surgery and lead to hypotension. So that was, uh, apart from the usual causes like bleeding, etc., which we know, a few things which can cause hypotension. Then uh, coming to infections. So after abdominal surgery, uh, how do we mark out infections? So a rise in TLC is part and parcel of uh, post-operative period. For the first 48 hours, your TLC will remain high and then it will drop, so will your CRP. So for the first 48 hours, it goes like this and then it starts dropping over the next three, four days. So one has to be careful in, in interpreting your CRP and your TLC post-operatively. And uh, if you want to cover abdominal sepsis post-operatively, if the patient does go into abdominal sepsis, then of course, gram negative is there, but we have to cover anaerobic as well as Canada. Canada has to be covered. If not in the first 24 hours, then if the patient is not improving the first 48 hours, early use of anti-Canada drugs or uh, antifungals has to be done because Canada is a normal commensal in the gut and post-abdominal surgery is not uncommon to have Canada sepsis. And um, even enterococci, which is not so common in India and in the Asian countries, but definitely more common in the West, has to be covered with the gram-positive cover because meropenem does not entirely cover uh, all the enterococci that we have. We have different species, so we have to give consideration to even using a positive gram-positive cover for enterococci at times. It definitely you see it much more than we do. We don't have so much of enterococci. Then coming to malignant hyperthermia. So once in a while, we get malignant hyperthermia also. The patient will be under sedation and you will not, I mean, he will not really complain. So when you get an elevation in temperature, you will get an elevation in your PCO2, an elevation, a persistent tachycardia, persistent hypertension. So you got to pick it up. And a prior normal surgery does not rule out malignant hyperthermia. And as you, most of you will know, it occurs after scoline, occurs after halo, you know, halofluorence. So one has to be aware of this complication. It does occur once in a while and it's, it's treatable. So it is important to pick it up. Dantrolene is the drug of choice. Then coming to ileus. So after uh, your surgery, you are supposed to start early feeding. And if the patient is not tolerating feeding, has gone into ileus, he will manifest with distension, nausea, vomiting. Flatus is not really a good sign. I mean, you may or may not look at flatus, but flatus is not one of the things you have to look at 
to assess ileus anymore. So uh, if you start feeding or the patient goes into nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, think of ileus. Causes are hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, uh, use of uh, narcotics, anticholinergic drugs. Then Ogilvy syndrome has to be thought of in the elderly patients who are elderly with Parkinsonism or other kind of disorders. They are prone to Ogilvy. Then uh, peritonitis occurring. And of course, if there has been intrahop uh, hypotension or lack of perfusion to the gut, that can also show the patient into ileus. And uh, coming to the respiratory part, now some of the patients may be prone to respiratory failure or you think, or you think that he is prone to respiratory failure, uh, then you have to actually use NIV. If you can use NIV for the uh, next uh, 24 hours after surgery, except in esophageal or gastric surgery. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can get post-operative hyponatremia also. Post-operative hyponatremia is actually an acute hyponatremia because it develops within the first 48 hours. Uh, and uh, any, so any hyponatremia that develops uh, within the 24 or 48 hours is known as acute hyponatremia. The cause of post-operative hyponatremia is nausea, vomiting, use of narcotics, uh, pain, all this leads to release of ADH and the use of dilutional fluids like 5% dextrose contribute to acute hyponatremia. And this is a kind of emergency in the sense that you have to use boluses of 3% saline to treat uh, post-operative hyponatremia. So these were some of the things uh, that uh, just wanted to highlight pertaining more to abdominal surgery. And uh, with that, I think we'll conclude the session as uh, there are no questions. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Karthik. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Tapesh. Thank you.